All right, well, we're going to go back to B sound. B sound. There you go. <laughs> you know, speaking of that, science says that when that light is made up of two particles, and they are convinced that it's made up of two sound particles, and those two sound particles, of course, would be God saying, light, B. So there you go. So anyway, <clears throat> now we are in... Uh, we're on page 34, 35, and you can see the scriptures there in page 36. The entire theme of Psalm 119 is the value of God's word. You can go through the whole psalm. It's amazing what it says. Uh, but you'll also notice Luke 138. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. That's a good way to say things. <clears throat> in Luke 229, it said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Over and over again. In Luke 5, verse 5. And Simon answering him, answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And we know what happened. They had a great haul of fish. In John 17, 17. He said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. All right? In Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So if you don't know the scriptures or the power of God, you're always going to, you're always going to err, right? If you go back and read that story, it's pretty amazing because the Sadducees had come to Jesus with a hypothetical situation and said a man had a wife, but he died. And their custom was that the brother was the brother of the man that died is supposed to take the wife. And so they went through seven brothers, and none of them had you know uh, children through them. And they said, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And the amazing thing is that the, the secret to this is going back and re reading who is actually asking the question. The person asking the question, the people were the Sadducees. Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. So they were trying to use that in a way to try to make it seem as though the resurrection wouldn't work. You know, whose wife would she be? He said, and they were trying to throw up a hypothetical situation. And Jesus said, you err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he talked about how, uh, you know, in the, as they would say, the regeneration, uh, that they would not, you'd not be, you'd be like the angels and not given into marriage. So, uh, but it's just funny who said that. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. If somebody comes to you <clears throat> asking a question about something they don't believe in, they're probably trying to trap you in your words, right? Just something to remember. Now, <clears throat> notice he also says in uh, John 10, now this is a question a lot of people have problems with or a statement, scripture. John 10, 30 through 38, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Now see, people get all bent out of shape over that. You have to realize uh, you know, a lot of Christians wouldn't want to even go this way. But you have to remember, God told them, you will have no other gods beside me. So there are other gods that you can have. Do you understand? But there's only one God who is God. And so many times, even the other gods that the, that the Egyptians followed and that the various uh, ites, the Canaanites, the, you know, all the different ites in the Bible, right? The Jebusites, all of them. Those gods were actually demons. And that's what Paul later said, you followed things that you, as gods that were not God, but they were actually demons that drew you off. And so, but now we know, you know, let's get real. A boat can be a God. A car can be a God, right? You can make anything a God, but just because you make it a God doesn't make it God, right? But you also have to realize that when we were put here, remember what it said about uh, Satan, that he's the God of this world, and that the way he got to be God of this world was that it was given to him, and he can give that away to anybody he wanted to, right? Why? Because Adam gave him that position, which meant technically, before Satan was the God of this world, Adam would have been God of this world. Now, see, people get upset because they use the word God. All God means in this term is the one who is sovereign 
or who has ultimate authority over a given area. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, yesterday we talked about uh, dominion, and we talked about the position of dominion we're supposed to be in. Now, see, if you don't understand that, that's why I talked about it yesterday, if you don't understand it, and especially if you don't function in it, then there are scriptures that you're never going to be able to truly understand and especially never truly walk out. One of those is, Jesus said when he returns, he will say, you've been faithful over one city. I'll put you over five. You've been faithful over five cities. I'll put you over ten. Right? So there is a, an aspect where we are to be faithful over a city, having dominion over that city, and that we are responsible for that city. Do you understand? And if you don't understand dominion and walking in that, see, we are our brother's keeper. But the church, through theology, has tried to, in a faulty theology at that, has tried to make it, well, we're not our brother's keeper, and everybody, you got to do it yourself. you you got to have faith for yourself. If you don't have faith for yourself, it's your fault. Well, he didn't say that. He said we are to be our brother's keeper, so we are to have faith for others, right? This is probably one of the biggest areas uh, where we catch a lot of flack, but also uh, one of the biggest differences. I actually have a book on it called Having Faith for Others. Because people was always saying, if a person is going to get healed, they've got to have their own faith. Well then, okay, uh, what faith did Lazarus have? He was dead, right? Somebody else had to have faith for him, right? I've heard one person say, well, you know, we don't know what Lazarus was believing. He was dead. Right? He was probably hoping somebody would have faith and raise him up, you know? He was probably hoping somebody would call Jesus, Right? But you have to realize, now think about this. If you can't have faith for others, intercession is useless. And whatever is not a faith is sin. So if you try to have intercession for people and you can't have faith for other people, then you're entering into sin by trying to intercede for them because you can't do it by faith if you can't have faith for other people. Does that make sense? Yes. See, that, that's what is amazing. When you start analyzing all these things, it, you know, we can approach this a thousand different ways. And every one of them lead us right back to the truth that Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth and we are in him and we exercise his authority on this earth. Amen? Amen. That's why when you lay hands on the sick, you say in the name of Jesus. You don't say your name. Right? It's his name. If it's his name, it's his authority. If it's your authority, use your name. See where that gets you. All right? Okay. Now, he says here, uh, they said, because you make yourself God. He said, is it not written in your law? I said, you're gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. So that proves again, number one, scripture can't be broken. But he did say this to them. And as I said, a lot of people get upset about it. But it's there. You got to deal with it, right? Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said, I am the son of God. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Now, before we go to the next section, because again, we're in, we are emphasizing that God's word is the final authority. Now, if we don't do that, then we will never be able to have any type of real discussion on anything. There has to be a basis for discussion. If, you know, and people say, I, I, I could read a scripture. And somebody says, well, yeah, I know it says that, but in our church, we do the, okay, wait, we're not talking about your church, right? We're talking about the Word of God, because the Word of God is our rule of action, amen? It is the final authority in our lives, so we have to go back to that. So you can't say, well, you don't understand, in the Lutheran church, we don't do this. What, what does that got to do with the Bible? See, we, we have to have some place, and we're not picking on the Lutherans, I could put any name in there. Right, But the point is, we have to have a, a point of discussion to say, okay, we agree with this, now we can discuss it. Otherwise, we're going to spend the rest of our time, well, we don't do this, well, that's not my way of doing it, that's not how we do it. Okay, then it's useless to talk about anything. So we have to decide, where, what is the common ground that all Christians should have? And it should be the Bible. Amen? Amen. Now, the thing is, the enemy is going to try to get you off of that. Just like he did Jesus, he's going to try to say things and Jesus has to say, it is written. You're going to have to be able to say, it is written. You're not going to be able to say, well, now, devil, Brother Curry said that I can tell you to go and you've got to go. 
Okay, we, we saw that happen with seven sons of Sceva. Right? And you do notice they commanded the devil to come out. Remember what they said? We command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Isn't that right? But guess what? It worked. The devils did come out. Isn't that right? It did come out and jumped on them and stripped them naked and chased them down the street. That's it's not the outcome they were looking for, right? But it did work. So you want to be able to do it like Jesus because we don't ever have any stories of Jesus being chased down the street by a devil, right? And then you got, now we have this new theology. Well, if a person has a devil and they want it, you know, you, should, you can't cast it out if they want it. Well, okay, first off, you don't get a devil accidentally, okay? Technically. Whatever, it is, no, you might not know, you have known you were going to get a devil, but you did what a devil likes. And when you do what a devil likes, you get a devil. That's the way it works. Well, I can't have a devil. I'm a Christian. Well, I don't care what you call yourself. If you got a devil, you got a devil, right? And so when people say this, we have to realize that devils hang around people that do what they like. You don't always have to cast a devil out. Now, it, it's quicker, right, to cast it out or to have someone cast it out, and you can cast one out of yourself, right, uh, till you get to a certain point. But now you have to realize that if a person wants a devil, do you realize that Jesus said, he said, all authority, in, in uh, Luke 10, 19, he even tells, he says, behold, I give unto you power, isn't that right, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, first off, people say, well, if I cast out a devil, what if it jumps on me? Okay, if you have the power to cast out a devil, it don't want on you. Why? Because you don't do what it likes. It will go to where, it will go to somebody that will do what it likes, Right? That's why whenever you got saved, you lost some of your old friends. Why? Because you weren't doing the things they liked to do, right? And if you still got all your old friends and they didn't get saved, you might want to wonder if you were actually saved. <laughs> Are you still doing the things you used to do, right? So now you have to realize that this devil, okay, they will hang around people that do what they like. So even if you don't cast it out, if you just stop doing what it likes, eventually you'll starve it out. It'll just quit hanging around you if you don't do what it likes. And so uh, you don't always have to have it cast out, but it's, like I said, much quicker and better. Now, in years ago, and, and again, remember, the reason this is so important, uh, the aspect of the Word of God being final authority, I'm telling you above everything else, this is the one thing that the enemy's going to try to do. And then the Word tells us very clearly that the thief comes immediately to steal the Word that was given to you. Right? If you read Mark chapter 4, the parable of Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, if you don't understand that parable, you're not going to understand hardly anything of the kingdom. Right? So it's good to understand Mark chapter 4 and Matthew 13. Those two chapters uh, really get a hold of uh, spiritual principles. And one of those, in it, he says that the, the, the enemy comes immediately to steal the word. And persecution arises for the word's sake. So all of this, the enemy is trying to get the word out of you. Because if he can, now notice, he doesn't, I've heard this quoted different ways, but the scripture says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He does not come to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why? He comes to steal the word, and because if he can't steal the word, he can't kill or destroy. So he has to steal the word first, then he can kill and destroy. But as long as you hang on to that word, he can't kill or destroy. So what he's trying to steal is he's trying to steal the word that was in, that's been put in you. That's why when people hear about healing, usually if they don't, well, it kind of depends actually. <clears throat> Some people receive it with gladness. Again, Mark chapter 4, take it. And when persecution, or, you know, different things come up for the word's sake, then they fall away. When, in other words, when the heat's on, they fall away. You know, you, you hear this healing teaching, and you go and talk with your friends at work, and you, yeah, I just went to this healing center. Oh, you don't believe in that stuff, do you? Well, well yeah, well, that's, that's foolish. That's old superstition. That's this, you know, that passed away or whatever. And all of a sudden, you start getting beat down, and eventually, you, you don't want to get beat down by your friends. You want to stay friends, so you kind of push away the teaching so that you can draw near to them. And so that's the enemy stealing the word out of your heart. Now, what usually happens is people receive one of two ways. They either receive it with gladness or they reject it outright. If they reject it, now, regardless, many times after you hear the, the word of truth on any topic, 
Okay? It could be on healing. If you hear it on healing, the enemy is going to come immediately to steal that word. How does he do that? Usually, it's through sickness. So after you hear the truth about healing, usually he comes immediately to try to make you sick so that you will go, well, I guess that didn't work. Well, it does work. You just get a chance now to put it into practice, right? But you can learn how to resist so that he can't steal it. See, the key is not letting him steal it, right? <clears throat> then other people don't receive it at all. Well, he makes them sick just because he can, right? And there's no resistance whatsoever. So there is a resistance uh, that you can build up and that you can put forth toward the enemy. Now, in, for instance, well, I'll, I'll give you this example of how important this is. Because like I said, he's always coming to steal the word out of your heart. <clears throat> Years ago, uh, we were in Italy. Maybe you've heard this story before. But we were in Italy, and I was preaching at a church up on a mountain. It was an amazing church. None of the walls were solid. In other words, they could move them. And it was just almost like a pavilion when they moved the walls. And it was on top of a mountain overlooking the Mediterranean Ocean. It was beautiful. It had never been preached in before. It was a brand new church, and they asked me to come, you know, do the inaugural preaching. And so I was teaching in the DHT. We go up. They move these walls open. We're sitting there. The breeze is coming through. It was hard to stay focused. I'll be honest with you. Look, looking out at that beautiful ocean, and the Sicily was across them. It was just amazing. So, <clears throat> but we had this meeting, and at the end of the first day, actually, they said, there's a young man here named Angelo that got shot. He was shot and he was, uh, he's brain dead. He's been brain dead this long time. It was like a long time. And so they said uh, he's on life support, <clears throat> but they're just doing that for the family to get in. Once all the family gets there, they're going to pull the plug and he'll be dead. But he's already classified as dead, but they classified him as brain dead, technically. <clears throat> so they said, would you go and pray for him? I said, yeah, let's go. So we go down the mountain, get down to the hospital. <clears throat> they won't let anybody in but one person at a time. And so when we get in there, they uh, put the, all the stuff on me, you know, like you have to put on the gown, the mask, all that kind of stuff. You have to go in. <clears throat> Once I got in there, I pulled some of it off anyway. But I got in, and they wouldn't let anybody else go in with me, but there was a whole bunch of people <clears throat> in the emergency room there or in the, uh, that ICU ward. <clears throat> and they were, it was a one big room, and they were all on different beds around. They had to take me to where Angelo was. And it was funny because they got me all dressed up, and the wind, there were windows that had no glass in them, and birds were flying through. But they make me put on gloves and a mask. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, man, the birds are free to come and go as they want. So it's just a, a note you know, that I made to myself. And so I'll go over to Angelo's bed. His eyes were open. They had to put a salve on it because his eyes wouldn't shut. And so I walked over to him. I put my hand, one on his leg, one on his arm, and I said, Angelo, uh, my name is Curry Blake. I'm here in the name of Jesus to wake you up. You will awake. You'll remember everything perfectly, all your uh, functions, your brain will function correctly, your body will function correctly. Be healed in Jesus' name and awake. And then I turned around and walked off. Nothing, I saw nothing happen. I went back to the front door. When I got out the door, everybody, there was about probably 12, 15 people because they heard we were going, so everybody gathered around. And so they all swarmed me. And they all said, Brother Curtis, what, what did the Lord speak to you? I said, yes. Oh, what did he say? I said, he said, I will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Mark 16. Oh, so the Lord did not speak to you. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, he spoke to me. Oh, what did he say? He said, I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So the Lord did not speak to you? I said, he spoke to me. <laughs> Brother Cody, what did he say? I said, he said, I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Why? Because this is God speaking to me. Amen? Amen? I don't have to hear it. Isn't, it. isn't it amazing? If you go into a contract with somebody, you want it written. Isn't that something? We always want it written down. We want it written. And yet God has given us a signed in blood contract and we want to hear something that's not even binding. You understand? The, the word you, that you just hear, you don't know who's saying it necessarily. I mean, I understand. You can tell by the message. But the key is, it's funny how we want it written down until God writes it down and now we want something else. Like I tell people all the time, God's already written you a letter and you're waiting on a phone call. So you don't need a phone call from God. You've got a letter written that you can always go back to that's not going to change. Amen? Amen? That's how solid this is. God was so sure about healing that he wrote it in the book. So it's done, right? That's how solid he is on it. Now, so they're all asking me, and finally, they, they, get, they give up. Why? Because I can outweigh them, and I'm not going to change what I've said now. And so you have to learn. Uh, 
<laughs> That's one of the key things. You have to learn. So my wife always said, you're the most stubborn man I've ever met. I said, I'm not. So I used to be stubborn. Now I'm, it's called sanctified perseverance, right? <laughs> used to, it was just stubbornness, but it's different now. So but the key is you have to lock into something, believe it more than whatever you see in front of you. And one of the best ways to do that many times when people start coming to you, just open your Bible and put it in front of your face and just see that and don't look at what they got, just look at this. But speak to them what this says. And whenever you believe this more than when you believe what you see, what you see will change to line up with this. It's just that simple. But that requires a grit. It, re it requires the ability, a, a tenacity to not change no matter what. And so they all left. We went on down, went back to where we were staying. We were staying in this seven-story apartment thing. They gave us a room on the, or an apartment on the very top. Uh, the people that invited us, our host, owned this apartment complex. And so we go up, and we're there overnight. And then later that evening, uh, my host comes to me. Well, actually, he got on the, tele the um, intercom and said, Brother Craig, can I come up and talk to you? And so I said, okay, which I don't generally like that uh, because I usually tell them I'll meet you somewhere because if you bring them to your place, they stay forever. <laughs> and you can't get rid of them because you can't leave because <laughs> you'll leave them in your apartment or your <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> so you can't, and you know, two things, always go where they are and always drive your own car. <laughs> that way, if you need to, you can leave, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so stuff you don't get taught in Bible school, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so... Now, um, so uh, he said, can I come up? And I said, yeah, come on up. So he came up. I opened the door. I met him at the door. I didn't invite him in. Just stood at the door. He said, uh, Brother Cuddy. And he was fidgeting around, and I'm looking at him. and said, yeah, uh, Brother Angelo. Angelo, yeah, Angelo, okay, yeah. Um, well, Brother Angelo, he's, um, uh, Angelo is, uh, he, and he's just, just him hawing around. And finally, I'm like, come on, man, spit it out. What, what's going on? What's Angelo? And he's like, uh, Brother Angelo, uh, he is dead. I said, hmm, that, that surprises me. And he's waiting for me to give an excuse. He's standing there looking at me like, why did he die? And I'm looking at him like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to change. I've already put my faith out. I'm not going to pull my faith back and make excuses to save face or to save my reputation. Amen. And so I just stood there and looked at him, and I can outweigh him, right? Because I can be stubborn, right? <laughs> and finally, he goes, okay, uh, well, we will see you tomorrow. And I said, yeah, see you tomorrow. And he left, right? And so then I went, now on this trip to Italy, uh, it was me, my wife, my daughter, and my mother-in-law. Right then I learned, take another young man with you to carry luggage, right? Because I ended up carrying all the luggage. <laughs> and an, an Italian uh, elevators, they're about as big as this pulpit here. I mean, it's, they're this small. You have to sit on the luggage to go up and they're slow and, and, but they're small. Uh, so if you don't know, if you're on the, an Italian elevator with somebody and you don't know them, by the time you get off, you know them. Okay. Uh, because you're that close. So I, I told my wife, I said, now I'm going, I said, I'm fixing to go for a walk, which to her, she knows that means I'm going to go pray. Cause that's how I like to pray. I really don't like praying. I'll pray indoors, but I'd rather get out and walk. And so I go out and get on this elevator, a little bit of elevator, the door shuts, and immediately I'm talking to God. I mean, I'm like, okay, this ain't, no, nah, this ain't happening. And I'm just talking to him like I would, well, not like I would anybody else necessarily, but very blunt. And I said, this ain't happening. I said, you don't send me halfway around the world. I did not come halfway around the world to give these people a false hope. Now, I don't care what you do, but Andrew, I don't care if you resurrect him. I don't care. I, you know, revive him. I, I don't care. But Angelo lives or I quit. I'll go home because I, I ain't doing this. And then about the time the elevator got to the bottom, ding, the door opened and I shut up. Why? Because there were people around and, you know, I wouldn't talk to you that way in front of people. I'm not going to talk to God that way in front of people, right? <laughs> so I go for a walk and I pray in tongues for about 45 minutes just walking around. And then I come back in, go back up, go to bed, get up the next day, drive back up the mountain. And when we get up there, they have me at the back and I'm putting the microphone on and everything. And uh, our host comes running up, Brother Curdy, Brother Curdy, have you heard about Angelo? I said, I heard he's dead. Like, why? Because that's what, I, he asked me what I heard. I'm not saying what I believe. I'm saying what I heard. He said, have you heard? I said, this is what I heard, right? And so he said, no, 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 Angelo, he lives. Angelo lives. And I said, 
No, I didn't hear that because I'm still putting the microphone on. I said, no, I didn't. No, he, he awake. Angelo awakened. He knows everyone. He is speaking. He remembers it. Oh, it's a great miracle. I'm like, glory to God. I said, I hadn't heard that. And I turned to walk off. And he said, Brother Curry, yesterday, when I tell you that Angelo, he is a dead, you say, hmm, that surprises me. He said, why you say this? I said, because I'm not used to losing. And he goes, hmm. I mean, like it's some deep revelation that we're not supposed to lose, right? But it is written, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. That means we should never lose, right? It says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Isn't that right? And it says that, now notice this, if the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, and thanks be unto God, which always causes me to triumph, then wherever I go, I'm going there to win. Isn't that simple? So if I'm supposed to go to the hospital, I'm going there to win. I'm not going there to lose. I'm not going there to give last rights, right? I don't give last rights, right? I go there to win. I go there to overcome. I go there to conquer in the name of Jesus. Amen? Now, so out of that, what the, now here, the reason I tell that story, I don't tell, I've got so many testimonies. We could be here weeks. I'm, I'm serious, every day doing nothing but give testimonies. I'm so blessed. I've seen so much. We've got 45 albums photo albums. Each one holds between 350 and 425 photos. All of those are testimonies from where I've been around the world, different healings, different things. We've got testimonies. we got pictures of all this stuff. Uh, they're stacked up in my, in my office. Now we don't hardly even use regular cameras and get pictures, you know, produced anymore. So it's all on phone and all that kind of stuff. I actually brought some stuff. I have it. I'll try to bring it over the next, the, the next session. Uh, but I, I've got some videos, some testimonies and things. But we could be here weeks but the, re the reason I tell these specific testimonies is because they have a principle that you need to get. Now, the principle that I'm talking about here with Angelo is a principle that once you put your faith out there on the Word of God, you don't back off no matter what. Now, you may look stupid at some point. See, whenever he came and said Angelo was dead, I was looking kind of stupid, right? But I didn't make an excuse. Why? Because it's not my name on the line. It's his name. You get it? You have to realize, we didn't think healing up. God thought it up. This is his deal, right? This, he put that in the book. If he didn't want us to believe it, he shouldn't have put it in the book. Because he you knows sooner or later, somebody's going to be dumb enough to actually believe what's written. Amen? And so you realize that you, if you stand on the word, once you find the word, now you gotta, it's got to be rightly divided. It's got to be in context, right? You can't just pull it out. Now you can. It's amazing. You can pull a word out of context, and if you believe it, not that you know it's out of context. I'm saying if you just pull it out and you don't know it, but you believe it and you release your faith in it, it'll still work to a degree, even if it's not accurate. That's why people with wrong doctrine about healing still get some results. Why? Because they will, you know, have other things. Well, well, this is the anointing, or this is that thing, or this is this gift, or whatever. And they don't even know really what they're talking about, but they accredit it to that. And it works for them because they can release their faith in it. Now, we want to be accurate. And the more accurate you get, the better the results are. One thing that we've noticed is that because there are many camps of healing. There's a lot of different ideas, a lot of different teachings about healing. And some people even take people with them on mission trips and they see great healings and different things. And people say, well, okay, I'm going to go with this person and I'm going to go on a mission trip and I did that and I'm seeing healings. Now I'm going to go over here and this person has a gift and I'm going to see how they operate and I'm going to get that gift and I'm going to learn how this and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to listen to Curry Blake and I'm going to get this DHD and I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to create all, I'm going to put all the best of every one of them together. And that sounds great. The problem is what you end up with is not a true theology, but you end up with a Frankenstein theology where you just put this piece and that piece and I'm going to pull from this and this. And here's what we've learned. If you are getting, okay, most people, on the average, our success rate, once I started, remember I talked about earlier, when I was at my home, 100% of the people got healed. When we started traveling, immediately it dropped to probably just below 70%, which really bugged me because I'm thinking, no, I've seen. See, one, as they say, once you've been in the fire, the smoke won't do. Well, once you've seen 100%, you know, 70% won't do because you know something's wrong. And so I started analyzing it, and I started realizing what it was is that I was not able to 
What I was doing is I was not ministering the same to people as I traveled that I would do in my home. Because I knew in my home, I could take time, I could do this, and I could minister to them over a period of time, and they could come back. But when I travel, many times I don't see people more than once. So I had to learn how to release the same power, the same faith, at, in one dose, so to speak, as opposed to over a period of time, right? And so we had to adjust. When I did adjust that, now our success rate went back up, and usually, uh, from, now this is just from what we can ascertain by, by testimonies we get, because it's, it's hard to follow up, you know, once you leave, because everybody doesn't call you, you know, it's, it's not like I get everybody's phone number and I call you every day, you know, for the next 60 days and to see what, where you're at or what's going on. But based on the reports we get, we can average uh, or we can uh, ascertain that we get approximately 94 to 97% 90 success rate. It could be higher, but some people don't get back in touch with us. So it's hard to judge it exactly. Now, I had an opportunity to back off the Word of God, but I didn't. Now, if you think about it, whenever they came and told me that Angela was dead, I could have done like most people had would do. Oh, well, you know, sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. No, that, you, that's not chapter and verse. Chapter and verse is thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Amen? Uh, chapter and verse says that w with faith, all things are possible to him that believes. Isn't that right? So that's where we should be standing. Now, I, but I had the opportunity to, to back off. I could give you many, many more examples of the same thing where I did things, and, and not just in healing, but in other areas because I had to develop, for, you know, the need was there for me to develop faith in healing. So that was fairly easy in the sense of it, it had to be done. But other areas I had to develop my faith, which was much harder because I'd been taught so far against things, things in areas of finances and whether God wanted to, to bless me or whether he wanted me to even just survive, you know, in some cases. Uh, because in some of the circles I was raised around, you know, poverty was seen as, a, you know, the blessing of God. You were holy if you were broke. And, you know, and if you, if you got a job promotion or, or got a, a raise, uh, you must be compromising or doing something. And that's not true, right? It could be, but it's not true. I mean, you understand? So I had to develop faith in those areas. And so, but with healing, it was always pretty easy because I knew God had healed me. I knew it was true, but I had to find out how to get it to work. So then I had to learn how to stand on the word and not back off no matter what. Now, I'll give you another example real quick because this one, was was harder, to be honest with you. I mean, let's admit, Angelo, live or die, I didn't know him. He wasn't family. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sound cold or anything toward that, but I'm saying it, it, was, it was good that he lived, but if he hadn't and I had left, after, over a period of time, I probably would have forgot about it. Amen? I mean, does that make sense? Now, but whenever my daughter, when I had started traveling, preaching, I was in Colorado, I was actually preaching in a church that A.A. A. Allen pastored before he started his tent revivals, and, and so it was a, a historical church there, and so I was there teaching a DHT, and the first day before the first lunch break, my phone, at that time I had my phone <clears throat> on the deal because I was using the timer on it, and I kept seeing the, it ring, basically, it was on silent, but I kept seeing it, and so I was noticing it. And, but I didn't answer it. It was my home. And then they started putting 911 on there, 911, which obviously is an emergency. And so as soon as we took a break, I went back, called my wife. My daughter, Crystal, was uh, going into delivery. Now, she w this was several weeks before she was supposed to be delivering her first child. And so my wife called me and said, listen, you need to pray. Crystal has, is uh, going into labor. Uh, she's developed uh, toxic anemia. She's done this thing. Uh, they've actually have her hooked up on monitors. They said that she had actually passed away two times already, but they were able to bring her back. This is all during delivery. And she said, you need to come home. And, and they, Crystal was awake. She could talk to him. And so my wife said, here, she wants to talk to you. So here's my daughter. Okay, now you have to remember, my first daughter passed away. <clears throat> Whenever Crystal was born, she was born exactly nine months after my first daughter passed away, we believed God for her. We confessed what the scriptures say about children, and we confessed that we were going to have another, that God was going to replace our first daughter 
with another. They'd be an identical twin. Crystal was an identical twin. I can show you pictures of both of them. They're identical twins. They had some of the same mannerisms, okay? And so all this is going on. So this is the daughter that God replaced our first daughter with. Yeah, I hate to use that term, but you understand what I mean. And it, so this was, you know, the devil had killed our first daughter, right? That, when I say that, it doesn't mean she went to hell. The devil can kill people necessarily, but he doesn't determine where they go. Amen? So you know, some, some people get upset when I say those things. But the devil killed our first daughter, and here he was trying to kill the replacement daughter. Okay? And so my daughter is on the phone. She said, and you could hear it in her voice. She was very weak. And she said, Dad, where are you? I said, I'm, I'm in Colorado. And she goes, well, I need you here. Why aren't you here? And that's hard, especially when you've already lost a daughter. And so I told her, I said, listen, I said, there is nothing I could do there that I can't do from here. I said, there's, there's nothing. And I said, so I, I, I said, I can't come off the field. I can't come home right now. I said, I will be back in three days. Now, the pastor had already had, a, he had some people there. He said, listen, I got a, a, one of our church members has a plane. He's a pilot. He can have you back home in about four or five hours. He said, we can get you back home if you want to go. I said, no. I said, I'm here. We need to do this. And so now the, the reason I said that is because this, and I told my family, my family know this now. They've, they've seen it. I told them, listen, if I come off the field because the enemy hits you with something, then from now on, you're a target. And every time I go to preach, he's going to try to hit you with something to get me off the field. And I said, so I can't come off the field. I said, it's not that I don't love you. It's that I love you enough. But I also have to remember that what I'm doing is the most important thing on this earth. I said, if I was in the military and this was going on, they're not going to send me home for this situation. And if I can't come off the field for, for, for a natural government, I can't come off for a spiritual government. Amen? And I said, now, I said, and then I had, I prayed for, and she, you know, she, she did fine. Uh, my grandson was born, no problems, everything's fine, right? Now, and I told her when I came back home, I said, look, uh, my grandson's name is Levi, and, she, and I said, listen, whenever Levi starts to grow up and he starts looking at the pictures and he's going to say, Grandpa, I see you, you weren't there. Where were you? I'm going to tell him I was preaching the gospel. And then his question would be, well, why, didn't, why weren't you there? Why didn't you come home? And I'm going to tell him, because you're not more important than the gospel. Because if I said I came home because you're more important than the gospel, then he, why would he ever give his life to something he's more important than? Do you understand what you do, how you live your life has ramifications. It has repercussions, even in your family. And if you teach them that the gospel, that they are more important than the gospel, then they will never serve the gospel. They'll expect the gospel at best to serve them. So there's a lifestyle that goes along with it. That isn't easy, but it was the best thing I could do because I didn't want my family becoming a target from then on. Because this is, see what people forget. We act as though there's not a devil. We act as though all healing is all dependent on God. It's not. There is an enemy, and healing is warfare between two kingdoms. One kingdom wants to kill everybody, and the other kingdom wants to heal everybody. Right? And we have to decide how we're going to operate in this warfare because it is warfare. And warfare is not always pretty. It's not always convenient. You know, I, I tell people all the time, especially in, the, in the, some of the early years, I never got to finish a meal because in the town we lived, it was fairly small and there were only a few places to go eat and we would go eat these places and people knew me. So I'd be sitting there eating and people would come up and ask me to pray for them while I'm eating. And I had to learn to be able to minister to them while I'm eating because if I quit eating, I would never eat, right? And that's why many times we go eat, we go places, we'll go out to eat with people and especially if my daughter's there, she's always said, Dad, you got to eat because she traveled with me probably more than any other one person. And she said, Dad, you got to eat. You got to eat because I'm always answering questions. So they're asking questions and they're, you know, and they say, do you, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, no, uh, but the problem, and they'll say, you know, a quick question or a short. I said, it's not your quick questions. It's my long answers. Because <laughs> while you're, you ask a quick question, you go back to eating. Now, instead of eating, I'm trying to answer your question. And I'm not going to give you some, you know, little thing that just placates you. I'm going to give you an answer. And so my daughter's always told me, Dad, you got to eat. So we, we've, and a lot of times, uh, you know, 
we just don't go out to eat with people because of that, because otherwise I don't get to eat, which, you know, is a bad option. But anyway, and so we have to realize that uh, what we're trying to do is get this into people so that they don't need me. My job is to work myself out of a job, right? Because I don't want you to say, well, I got healed last time Brother Curry was here. Uh, and, and if you want to get healed, you know, he'll be coming back in a year. He'll be coming back. So, let's get, no, that's not the idea. The idea is you get this because I'm not special. There's no, nobody in this room that's special. There's only one name that's special, and that's the name of Jesus. Amen? And, and people say, well, yeah but, yeah, but you're anointed or you're this. No, no, no. If you're born again, you're anointed. It's that simple, all right? And we're going to talk about that. Matter of fact, do you realize, just, just throw this in there, and then we'll take a break here in just a minute. Do you realize, in, well, in, in Hebrews 11, I'm not going to take you there, but you, you can go there if you want to. But Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Moses, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Enoch. Remember that? Yes, over and over again, it says, by faith, by faith, by faith. Do you realize it says, by faith, David? He says, when it comes to Samson and David and Jephthah, all these guys, he said, I don't even have time to talk about it. Isn't that right? In uh, verse 32. And so you have to realize all these names, you realize everything they did, it says they did by faith. It never says they did by an anointing. Think about that. It never says by anointing they did this. By anointing David killed Goliath. By anointing. It never says that. It says by faith. You see, you might not have any control because now when we talk about the anointing, you can talk about different things about it. And usually most people don't even have a clear definition of it. And it's usually a, a catch-all phrase that means anytime power shows up. But you have to realize that's not what the anointing is. The anointing, and we'll show you from Scripture, the anointing has nothing to do with power. Nothing whatsoever. Right? Because, okay, let's just take one Scripture in uh, Acts 10.38. That's usually one people bring up. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that oppressed the devil, for God was with him. Right? And they say, see right there, anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. Okay, listen. If you're anointed... Okay, power is present, but it has nothing to do with power. The, pr the power is there because of it, but, it's, but if power and the anointing were the same, it wouldn't say with the an anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. It wouldn't use those two different terms because it would just, you would have known if power was the anointing, he wouldn't have to say with power. Does that make sense? So the fact that he uses all those terms, what, what it comes down to is this. In uh, 1 John in chapter 2, verse 20, and then in verse 27, it says that you have received an anointing that abides. You have received an, an anointing from the Holy One, and, and it says, and it teaches you all things. So now we know that the anointing teaches, but you never see anywhere where it says the anointing that there was power connected to it. What you see, again, we'll teach this whole thing uh, later today or probably first thing in the morning, but what you'll see is that over and over again it says <clears throat> they were anointed first, and then the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And the only time power was displayed is when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, not the anointing. Right? So the anointing has nothing to do with power. It has to do with position. David was anointed king. He was not anointed with power. He was anointed king. He was put into position as a king. And because of that, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. In Luke chapter 4, it says, Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He's not saying that the anointing and the, and the Spirit of the Lord is the same. He said, the reason the Spirit came upon me is because I was anointed. I was put into this position, and because of that, the power comes. So you have to realize, the only people that were ever anointed were the prophet, the priest, and the king. And that's exactly who we are. We've been made priests and kings under our God. Isn't that right? So th why? How were we? What, when was it that when we were put into that position, that's when you were anointed. So using the term, that person is anointed. Well, you, you might as well say that person's born again because that's what it means. He says, because you are sons, Galatians chapter 4 says, because you are sons, he has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Because you're a son, anointed into a position, he has sent his spirit. So first you're anointed in a position and then he sends his spirit and the spirit is power. So if you have the Holy Ghost, you have power. Why? Acts 1.8 says that it, you shall receive power, miraculous ability, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit shows up, power shows up. Do you get that? So you can be put into position. You can be anointed into position, and then the Spirit comes upon you right, to bring power to fulfill your position. Do you get that? So when you're put into position, now you need the ability to as many as received Him, John 1.14, to as many as received Him, 
gave he power, authority to become the sons of God. And because we are sons, he has sent forth his spirit. So first you're a son, then you receive the Holy Spirit. You got that? So because you're put into place as a son, then he sends his spirit, which brings the power to allow you to function as a son. You got that? Now that's basically the anointing teaching as a whole, but I'll give you a lot more scriptures when we go through it. But I want you to realize, you take glory, you steal glory from Jesus when you put the anointing on things instead of saying by faith. Because what it does is, what it's, the real purpose of you using the term the anointing on a person is you're saying they're anointed and I'm not. Therefore, I don't have to do what they're doing. So it takes responsibility off of you to do what they did. But if by faith they did it, and anybody can have faith, now you can have and do whatever they could do. So all you're doing when you use the term, you're using it as a scapegoat to get away from responsibility so you don't have to live the same life of faith that other people are doing. Right? So just think about this. And as I said, we will prove this as we go through.